make, and that was keep it short, meaning my remarks, because we have a special program. Um, a follow-up to Brian Schwartz's presentation about his trip to Poland and Hungary that he took in April. He showed one part of it, and we're going to complete it today. If you have tuned in online, we welcome you, and we are glad that you're worshiping with us. And I want to open with a hymn that I recently discovered. The tune is wonderful. The words are even better. And I think the lyrics truly do encompass the whole gospel. They were written, or they are attributed to Thomas Kempis, who was writing them just before the dawn of the Reformation. So it was the end of the Dark Ages. And this is the story of our salvation. And that's the story that the Reformation helped people, or that, yeah, the, the story of salvation that came about in the light of the Reformation. So if you would, turn to page hymn number 148. And I'll ask you to stand and we'll sing the first verse only um, in the honor of time, which Sabbath school does accelerate the clock. So if you would turn to hymn number 148 and rise. That hymn, um, it brought me to tears when I first read it, and then when I played the tune, I, I thought, this is wonderful. And actually, the tune was written, this particular tune, it comes in many different tunes, was written by James Bingham, who was the head of the music department and may still be at Washington Adventist University. Um, when Brian gave his first presentation from his experience on the trip, the war in the Ukraine was being presented to our consciousness day in, day out, more than it is at this moment in time. He told the story of the conversation he had with one of the Ukrainian women who was living in the basement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and it was housing as many refugees as it could hold, the, the church that is. She had fled her home carrying only her purse. And her response to Brian's um, question to her, what could he possibly do to improve her situation and or to help her was, and this is a quote, I am in need of nothing. I have everything that I need. Psalm 23 begins with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
And that verse took on new meaning for me in response to his sharing the story. Here, in our warm and cheerful homes in warm and cheerful Centerville, that's what the sign says, uh, it begins with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Here, this woman is speaking to us as a witness about what we have in Christ, which is everything. Our temporal situation can change very, very quickly, but we will be pursued with goodness and mercy all the days of our lives, no matter our fortune. Will we bless others as she did? Have I fallen in love with Jesus to the point of wanting nothing else? We can truly live in the house of the Lord forever. And that is the good news of the gospel. If you would bow your heads, we'll have prayer. Lord, God in heaven, the God of the universe, the God of our creation, thank you for the hope that you have given us. Whenever we look up instead of straight ahead, there is something better, and this earth is not our home. Most of you know Brian. Many of you were here for his first presentation, which was a blessing to me. And I have asked him if he would uh, complete his story about the trip this morning. Thank you, Brian. Well, good morning again. And welcome, everyone, and thank you, Debbie, for um, the opportunity. I was sitting there listening to the words of that song and thinking it was, I love how deep it was incredibly beautiful, the tune that it was with. I thought we probably should have sang all five verses so I could figure it out by the fifth verse. <clears throat> but uh, it was a very nice song. So I um, had the opportunity back in May to go to Poland and to Hungary with Pastor Mark uh, and his wife, Tini Finley, and my good friend, Denzel McNeilis, who's from ASI, and I was there representing AMEN, um, the Adventist Medical Evangelism Network. And the last time we talked, um, we were focused just on, on Poland, and today we're gonna focus a little bit more on Hungary and a little touch on Romania. So one thing that I mentioned last time, for those of you who remember, is that one of the most critical things that I think that I was there for <clears throat> is I wound up counseling with a Seventh-day Adventist pastor who shortly before we arrived who had been admitted to a mental ward because he was lying in a fetal position in his bed at home and could not get up because he was so despondent and in so much despair and depression from the stories that he was hearing of refugees of the abuse and of the things that were happening during war um, that it finally got to him and he was breaking down. He actually got a day pass from the psychiatric hospital to come to church and to hear Pastor Finley and to, and to meet with us. And I had the opportunity to counsel with him through a translator, which is hard to do counseling. <laughs> um, and I'm a heart doctor, not, not a, a psychologist, but I just shared the, the gospel with him. and encouraged him and just gave him advice that I uh, could come up with. And so he and his wife had truly been taking care of refugees in one of the area churches day in and day out from the moment that he woke up to the moment that he went to bed from when the, the war had started. And it was, it was a huge ministry that they were doing, but at the same time, he was doing this all on his own. It was so intense that um, he didn't have time to take any time for himself. And so I had just counseled with him and gone over Psalms 22 with him, which was the experience that Jesus experienced on the cross and that Jesus himself felt despair. Jesus knows what it is to experience depression by experience <clears throat> and uh, that it's not a sin to be depressed. Um, if we wallow there and stay there, it can become a sin, but it's not a sin to experience depression. And I encouraged him, I said, look, you cannot carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. You cannot be every single person's counselor. You can't do this 
um, 18 hours a day and at the expense of your family and your personal time. And so I just encouraged him to start his day every morning with an hour of reading the Psalms. And I encouraged him to take a couple more hours off, take an hour and go to the gym and take an hour to go to the park with your wife. And so the reason I bring this back up is even by the end of the week that we were there, he'd say, oh, I just got back from the park. Oh, Dr. Schwartz, I just, uh, just uh, went out to eat with my wife. And so he was already putting things into practice. But I saw him just a couple of weeks ago. He was here in the United States. And uh, he just again stopped and thanked me that, you know, encouraging me to spend that hour um, in the Psalms was incredible and to take time with my wife and my family apart. So this just encouraged me and he was back um, strengthened and encouraged and back engaged in ministry. It was just a kind of amazing thing. And that was the one thing on the whole trip that made me think maybe that was the reason that I, that I was alone. There were many, many reasons. Um, with mission trips, um, often the people that go are more blessed than the people that we go to serve, and that was definitely the case. So after uh, six days in Poland, we moved over to Hungary. I spent four more days in Hungary, and uh, the whole purpose of this trip was to meet with church leaders and uh, pastors from the areas that were taking care of the Ukrainian refugees. We did meet a lot of refugees. I have over 12 hours of video of refugees that we interviewed and the stories are horrendous. So let's see, there's my next slide. So Hungary, the capital of course is Budapest. It's an incredibly beautiful city. Um, they don't allow any buildings over, over six stories tall so it kind of has an old world feel. Um, and Hungary was kind of preserved um, during World War II because it wasn't really invaded until the last year, year and a half of the war. <laughs> and uh, of course the Danube River runs through there. And uh, I didn't realize this, but um, Budapest has the oldest underground subway system in the world. It was the first one. This is one of the similar to looking, they were originally pulled by horse but this was the rail train that we took every day from our hotel up to the church where we were meeting with pastors. And it was just kind of interesting. And so it's a peaceful, um, beautiful city that borders Ukraine, which is still um, in the midst of devastation. Now, now the battle in Ukraine has kind of focused on to the east side, and we don't hear about it every single day because there's much of Ukraine that's going on as usual. So the refugees are no longer streaming across the borders to um, Romania and to Hungary and to Poland and to out into Germany and the other places as much as they were. They're now streaming more to western Ukraine because it's relatively safe and the battle is more confined to just the eastern side. But when we were there, um, Ukrainians were fleeing every which way and over 10 million had fled the country. Over 3 million had gone to Poland. It was only about 700,000 that came to Hungary. And uh, the Hungarians uh, were also welcoming of the, of the Ukrainian refugees. Um, this is a lady in the front who is a government official who is at the big welcome center in Budapest, which is a football stadium that has been converted to a care center for refugees. In the middle is um, our Adventist director of ADRA for the country of Hungary. And then of course Pastor Finley and then Thomas is the union um, president. He's a pastor and uh, we had the opportunity to meet with them. We had the opportunity to go to the center where refugees are welcomed. When they get there, some of them will call their friends and find places to stay. Um, they can stay in this facility for up to about 24 hours and then they need to find a place to go. They're given phone cards for their phones, they're given rail passes for the rails, <clears throat> they're given health cards. So in Poland I mentioned that there wasn't a really big need for amen to do medical clinics because the patients, the people that come are allowed to be patients in the government hospitals. And the same thing in Hungary. Um, they feed them a meal. Um, they can sit there and figure out where they're going to go uh, for their next stop. And this is the lady with all of her earthly possessions just sitting there and trying to figure out what she's going to do next. <clears throat> they can use the outdoor shower and bathroom facilities that have been brought in, <clears throat> but there are uh, facilities there and then they can s 
just rest. And when, while we were there, there were a few people behind the wall, the, the farther wall, but the place has been completely full at times. It was starting to settle down a little bit by the time we came through. Um, biggest thing you see is women and children that are affected by the war. The refugees are largely women and children because men between the ages of 18 and 65 cannot leave the country. So there's all kinds of programs. Our purpose was to go and meet with churches, with pastors, and so pastors for three different uh, conferences, the whole union came together, and Pastor Finley did a series on hope. I did a series on lifestyle and health. Um, and uh, it was just uh, an encouraging time to be meeting with over 200 pastors. The church that we were hosted at also takes in refugees. Now, they didn't have about 100 refugees like the one in Warsaw did, but they had about a dozen refugees um, that were staying there. And then many of the families had taken refugees to their homes. In Hungary, refugees were more commonly passing through and going to other places than just staying in Hungary. Hungary is a country that's fairly favorable to Russia, and so it doesn't quite have the same, you didn't see the Ukrainian flags flying on every single bus uh, like you did in Poland, but uh, nevertheless, they were taking in the refugees. And just amazing to see the, the kids and the kids that are affected by this. And so they've set up in the classrooms that would be the children's division for the church, they've set up uh, beds and cots, and some of them they pick up during the day and still do classes and others are just uh, still there. Um, this lady is, uh, is only, uh, I think, 26 years old and uh, she is a refugee. She, her husband is fighting in Ukraine. She hadn't heard from him in over a month, doesn't know if he's alive or dead. And her mother is a captain in the Ukrainian army as well. And so she's there with the youngest child, that's her uh, daughter, and the little girl in pink is her sister. And so they have taken all their stuff, they've fled Ukraine. The, the two sisters then, the older one with the NASA shirt and the one in pink are sisters, and the one with the NASA shirt and the little girl on the bottom is, that's her daughter. So those are aunt and niece, but just, out of their whole comfort zone. They don't speak the Hungarian language, they speak Ukrainian. They're being housed in the church. They knew nothing about Adventists, um, but the children are getting, going to the classes, they're getting fed every single day, and they put on a program for the children in the church where the children come together every day and learn about Jesus. We, uh, Pastor Finley wrote some materials and we were able to get those printed. I talked about that last time, how there was a press in Poland that has stocked up on paper, and they were able to turn these out in less than two weeks um, for materials, and they were just grateful to be able to get these few little toys and these little pamphlets and papers that the kids really enjoyed. And so, um, quite a few children and quite a few mothers is what you see, uh, young people. This is an interesting um, plaque that is on the wall in the main church in Bud Budapest. There's five churches in the area, but this is one of the original churches in Budapest where the conference office also is. And uh, the Finleys are looking at this and we're hearing a description about it. And uh, it says it's a Holocaust memorial. And so we met the pastor of this church. His name is Peter, but his grandfather actually had been the pastor of the church, this very church in Budapest during World War II. And during World War II, um, again, the Germans didn't take over and occupy Budapest until about the last year and a half of the war. And uh, therefore the city, and the city wasn't bombed to destruction because of that. Um, so it still stands and this church still stands. And at that time, Peter's grandfather was the pastor of the church and they were housing over 60 Jews that uh, just as the Germans did, they came in and were rounding up Jews from the city of Budapest. There were a lot of Jews in Eastern Europe and so they were housing 60 Jews in the basement of the church in Budapest, this very church that we were in. And um, on occasion, 
If they knew the Gestapo or the SS was coming, they would hide them in the baptistry, which is right under the podium on the main church. And there could be 30 or 40 of them in there and another 20 uh, or 30 down in the basement hiding. And they would have the congregation knew about this. The pastor lived in the church and he was taking care of them. And different members of the congregation would go out to their gardens and every day different people would bring food in to take care of 60 people. Can you imagine having to feed 60 people when there's ration cards and people don't have enough food? Well, people would come in and every day it was a different person so that the authorities didn't recognize what they were doing. The same person coming every day with a cartload of food. And they would feed the Jews, they would house the Jews, and they would be there. And on two occasions, the SS came in and looked around and didn't see anything. So finally, one day, while Peter was, Peter's grandfather was on the podium, standing over 40 Jews that were in the baptistry right below his feet, the SS, two SS soldiers came back. And this time they came back with a German shepherd. And they were going to search the building. And they walked right down the aisle. And he stepped down here. And he just said a quick prayer. And he said, how dare you bring dogs into God's house? Get out. <laughs> and they turned around and they walked out. And those Jews were never um, discovered. Some of you have heard of Wallenkamp, who was a Swiss ambassador to Budapest. There's been a documentary about him. He disappeared after the war, but he was giving, he was working directly with Peter's grandfather and other places that were taking care of Jews to create Swiss um, travel documents to help get the Jews out of Budapest at that time. And he was responsible for getting hundreds out of Budapest with false travel papers that were presented by the Swiss embassy. And so it was really a cool history to be in this church in Budapest that back during World War II was sheltering Holocaust, people that would, uh, were victims of the Holocaust, and uh, sheltering them at risk to their whole congregation and to see that kind of faith. And now that very same church is sheltering refugees from Ukraine. That was just an incredible experience. And so um, just to see um, the faith of the people and the young people um, just was encouraging. Um, they get together, the Ukrainian refugees get together and they have their own church. They sing songs, they do youth programs and the young people are still um, just very enthused and very encouraged um, despite what they've gone through. And this is a group of Ukrainian refugees that were singing, singing a song um, which just was um, powerful. It's, this is actually a video. I don't know if you can click on that and if that would play or not. Um, if it doesn't, it's fine. <clears throat> so one of the things, I showed you a picture of Thomas who was the union director um, for the union and the, the president of the union. He said that because of the Ukrainian refugees, because of their faith, they have become to our churches and Hungary is a pretty affluent area with kind of Laodicean churches just like we have here in North America. And his biggest observation is that we've reached out to the refugees, but they have inspired our people and they've inspired our churches to realize what true faith is. And he says, in a way, they have revived the church in Hungary um, because of being there. There's a lot of things I could share. I riled up a bunch of pastors in talking about our health message. <laughs> That wasn't accepted very well over there, but they're working on it. They were challenged by it. Um, but uh, it was really an amazing experience just to see what God is doing in that despite the most intense persecution, um, God's people from Ukraine have remained faithful. And those people um, have nothing in this world to rely on upon except faith in God who has seen them through. And uh, it just uh, inspired me to know that we're going to be facing that very same thing. And uh, do we really want to wait until we're under persecution to manifest our faith, um, to do Bible studies with our neighbors, uh, because you're forced to, because you're kept captive in a basement for 21 days? 
Or is that what it's going to take to, to get the church in Hungary on fire? Is that what it's going to take to get our church on fire? Is this sort of intense persecution? I hope it doesn't require that and that we are preparing now. Um, but it just opened my eyes to what is going on and what is going to come around the whole world. Um, not necessarily because of war, but there will be persecutions for various reasons. And uh, right now our brothers and sisters in Ukraine are still facing that. and We still need to keep them in our prayers. So with that, let's close and let's bow our heads for prayer. Well, Father in heaven, just uh, thank you for the opportunity to have met with refugees from Ukraine, to see almost uh, firsthand what the conflict over there is like, and to hear stories of just the devastation. Just thank you that we still live in a land of peace and safety. And because of that, we just pray that we won't become complacent. Just pray that you can use us, that you can send us out um, to be of service to those around us, our neighbors, um, our community, but even around the world. And we just thank you that we've had, we have this opportunity to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. And I just realized I have five more slides. <laughs> Because of going to, I went to Poland and Hungary, and uh, I'm the president of the Adventist Medical Evangelism Network, so we decided we didn't really need to do clinics in Poland and Hungary, but there isn't a real good government health system in Romania. Oh, that was going to play. So, the children just again always touch my heart. So, Amen did put on a dental and medical clinic in Bu Bucharest in Romania that I wasn't able to go to because this was right during the general conference, but we had 60 volunteers that all went. We're planning another trip this fall. And this was a group of, uh, from the Adventist Medical Evangelism Network as well as Southern Adventist University that went and took care of refugees in Poland, doing dental work, doing health screenings, and just outreach to refugees. And it was an amazing experience for those that went. And so as a church that has a lot of medical professionals, there's lots of ways to get involved, and there's still ways that we can help with the refugees in Ukraine as well as many other places. And so just we'll leave you with... That inspiration, the, the idea that you could still make a difference for people as you pray for them, as you meet with them, and as you meet their needs, whether you do medical work or whether you just want to volunteer, the needs are great. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. We have a class that meets here in the sanctuary. We have classes in both overflow rooms and down each hall. If you see someone that you don't recognize that may be a visitor, please invite them to go with you. Thanks so much. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Sabbath School. It's good to see each of you here this morning. And I am uh, thankful for Brian's presentation. Um, feel inspired and 
Appreciate that, Brian. <clears throat> well, um, looking forward to studying with you this morning on this topic. I've uh, really uh, appreciated this quarter's lessons. I'm sure many of you have as well. And um, why don't we go ahead and have prayer, and then we'll start. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the blessings that we've experienced uh, thus far with the presentation that we just saw and for Brian's experience there in, um, uh, in uh, Hungary. And we just want to lift up the situation there in Ukraine and Hungary and other countries that are dealing with the uh, results of conflict. And I uh, want to pray for the, the churches there in that area as they are ministering to the needs of refugees and um, bringing a message of hope to, uh, to the people there. Lord, strengthen them. I pray, Lord, that uh, we may as well um, be prepared for what is to come. And um, as Brian just mentioned, that we may exercise faith in, rel in a time of relative peace, uh, using the resources that we have, the knowledge that we have, um, the plan of salvation, um, Lord, may we share these things with uh, our friends, neighbors, and be a light to our community. And uh, Lord, as we're studying this morning this uh, important topic of hope, I just ask for your, your, your presence to be with us. May your spirit guide us and direct us. May our hearts be open to your leading, and um, may your word come alive for us this morning. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to begin by contemplating a question that I think is the most profound question that we as Seventh-day Adventists could consider. And so I want to look at four passages of Scripture, and uh, I'm going to actually ask if um, we could have uh, some of you read those passages. So uh, would someone uh, be willing to read Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 to 4? Brian said he would do that. Uh, another passage, Psalm 74, verses 10 and 11. Okay. And Psalm 34, 94, excuse me, Psalm 94, verses 3 to 4. Okay, Ron. And then Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. Anybody could read that. Revelation 6, verse 10. Okay, Cindy. All right. Brian, you have Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not say. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Okay. Next uh, passage, Psalm 74, verses 10 and 11. And then Psalm 94, verses 3 to 4. Okay, and then finally, Revelation 6, 10. Cindy? So what is that most profound question for, especially for Seventh-day Adventists? What did we see in these verses? How long? How long, O oh Lord? How long? That is the most profound question for Seventh-day Adventists. Why? Why is that such a profound question for us? <laughs> because for over 150 years, we have been preaching that Jesus is coming soon. And yet, generation after generation of Seventh-day Adventists, having believed that Jesus was coming in their lifetime, have passed to their graves. So the question is, what 
how can we keep the hope of the Advent burning alive in our hearts in light of the Lord's return, in light of the delay of, of our Lord's return? Are we dependent upon world events to give us that motivation and that, and that hope? Or is there something deeper and stronger that we need to base our hope upon? And so, um, of course, the, in order to, uh, to grapple with that question of how long, we need to understand, well, what is the reason for the delay? Is there a passage of Scripture that actually tells us specifically what is holding things up? What is that Scripture? Okay, it doesn't want anybody to be lost, all right? I think that's true. Yeah? Okay, Revelation chapter 3 tells us about the current condition of God's people. That certainly, uh, that certainly is, is um, a part of the reason. But, but is there a passage of Scripture that actually says, things are being held up, and here is why? The sealing of God's yeah, people. Yeah, it's the sealing. Revelation chapter 7 uh, tells us that God's plans are being held up because God's people are not yet sealed in their foreheads. And of course, the fragment in Revelation chapter 3 tells us that the condition of God's people, the latency and lukewarm condition that is uh, preventing God from, uh, from writing his, his seal in our, our foreheads. Well, when Jesus was here on earth, he asked a question. He said, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Amen. God is looking for an, a people who have an end time faith. But um, did you know that faith has a twin sister? Ellen White said that hope is the twin sister of faith. And so that means that God is looking for a people who not only have an end time faith, but they have an end time hope, an indestructible hope, uh, which is the title of our lesson this morning. And so God is looking for a people with a true end time hope that is based on a firm foundation, not just based upon world events, as important as those things might be, but a true, solid foundation. And that is what we want to study this morning. So let's go to Ro uh, Romans chapter 5. And uh, we want to look at um, Romans chapter 5 to get a... to glean some things about what is true biblical hope. And so I'm going to read the, uh, the entire passage from uh, Romans chapter 5, verses uh, 1 to 10. And as we're, we're uh, looking at this, think about um, what, uh, what, what do we find about hope in this passage. And I'm going to actually read from the New King James Version because I think it's a little bit clearer. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So I want to ask, from this passage, what can we glean about hope? What, how, do we, how do we understand hope from this, uh, this passage that we just read? Rob. 
Yes, Joe. I wonder if in the presentation that Dr. Schwartz gave, if while he was there in those countries, if he saw uh, an increased amount of hope among those who were going through the very difficult tribulation of fleeing as refugees and so on. I, I just wonder if, if there was any correlation because the scripture says here that that produces hope. Yeah, I, mean, I think people were devastated, they're traumatized, but at the same time they're clinging to faith and they still have hope. And that's what's energizing the Western European churches that are taking them in. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think the summary I, that I got from this is that oftentimes it's tribulation that, that increases our hope and, and that perseverance mm -hmm. of clinging to that hope like, like in the uh, refugee situation. Okay, so tribulation, uh, persecution kind of brings hope to the forefront, uh, it makes hope real uh, to us. Yeah, okay. What else do you see from this passage? Dr. Small. You know, in a sense that as we prepare for, for heaven, God is honoring us by giving us a postgraduate course in how to prepare the, uh, the, the tribulation, showing us, reminding us that this world is not my home. Mm. There is something, Abraham looked for a home that had mm -hmm. a city that had foundations. And rather than complaining, God, why are you doing it? You know, in a sense, I'm honored if he is putting in the effort to give me uh, the graduation, uh, the, the education that will fit me for heaven. That, mm -hmm. That's something I should say thank you for. Okay. All right. Very good. Scott. This passage, especially verses 6 through 10, we're without strength. We're ungodly. We're sinners. We're enemies. Yet God still kind of claims us. And can you see these videos where someone gets pulled over and, you know, my father's the county commissioner and you're in big trouble, right? Well, my father lives in heaven and you're in big trouble, right? So, so we have a claim to our heavenly father that gives us hope that we won't go get a ticket, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, so we have hope that God has our backs. Okay. That we're going to get through whatever it is. We really do have a savior. It's not blind hope. It's something that, that is anchored. It's something like there's a basis for the hope that we have, that we'll get through it, that there is an answer. I just need to hang on a little longer. It's really important that we recognize that. So that was one of the things, actually, thank you, Scott, that I realized about hope this week is that hope is not a wish. It's not a subjective expectation, but it is a confident expectation for the future providing the motivation to live a Christian life even in the face of tribulation. It's confidence. That's really what hope is. So, yes, Adelaide. Yeah. Verse 5 gives us a clue that it's the love of God and the Holy Spirit that are key okay. All right. So the love of God and the Holy Spirit. Yes, ab absolutely connected to hope. And I think I saw... Debbie's hand up. You hope in what you trust. Okay. You hope in what you trust. Okay. Very good. Other thoughts on this passage relating to hope? So did anybody see here that hope <coughs> is, um, is connected with self-emptying agape love? My wife just mm -hmm. mentioned that. <coughs> that it's hope comes from the Holy Spirit pouring love, or God pouring love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It is, possible, is it possible that such self-emptying agape love can be obtained by sinful man through Christ? I believe so. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 and 15 talks about this. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, compels us, motivates us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So it is the love of Christ that compels us, that gives this mo motivation for hope. That's one of the, the foundational pillars, I believe, for hope, is that self-emptying agape love. 
And uh, we've been talking about persecution, especially going through the, the end time persecution. I believe that if there is one taint of selfishness within us, that we will crumble going through uh, end time persecution that we must have that self-emptying agape love. And that is something that God gives to us um, as, as we were promised here in this passage. And so hope must be based on a deep appreciation for what Christ has done for us, as we read there in the last few verses of this passage. Other, other thoughts on hope from this, this passage? How about hope in its connecting, uh, connection to faith? Hope springs out of a justified state before God in Christ. Hope is the fruit of faith. A couple of other things that I noted here. Hope is transformational. Uh, Hope is connected to the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And so we see here that um, hope transforms us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, hope is a gift. Hope is a gift, and I want to sort of expand upon that idea here. Um, Everything, everything that we need for salvation is a gift from God. We think about repentance, um, we think about faith, trust, obedience, um, the self-emptying agape love, even hope. These are all things that Jesus worked out perfectly as a man, and then gives to us as a gift. And let, let's think about this for a moment. So Romans 2 verse 4 says that repentance is a gift from God. It's not something that we conjure up on our own. That Jesus, when he was here on this earth, Jesus actually experienced repentance corporately on behalf of the human race. You can read about that more in Desire of Ages in the chapter on the baptism. So Jesus worked out a perfect repentance that then he gives to us. Um, Faith. Faith is not something that we generate on our own, our weak and feeble, uh, uncertain faith. Uh, The Bible says that that, um, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. That faith is the faith of Jesus. That's faith that he worked out perfectly and then he gives to us. Brian. Yeah, I was struck with even verse 1 of Romans 5, therefore having been justified by faith, we quickly assume that's our faith, but that we are justified because of his faith. His faith, that's right. It's Jesus' perfect faith. We think about growing in faith, but it's not our faith, per se, that grows. It's just accepting more of the faith that Jesus then gives to us. It's his perfect faith. Uh, as, we be, as obedience becomes more of a natural thing for us, It's not our obedience that's imperfect. It's his obedience that we accept uh, that he gives to us. And so the idea here is is that it's the same thing for hope. Hope is something that Jesus worked out as a man and then he gives to us as a perfect hope that has a foundation that is uh, based on a, a solid foundation. In fact, Ellen White wrote in First Selected Messages 56, all our hopes have their foundation in Christ. Amen. So what I would like to do in the next uh, section here is to talk about what were the foundational pillars. If Jesus worked out a, a perfect hope that then he gifts to us, how did he develop that hope? What were the foundational pillars of Christ's experience in hope? And so what I'd like to do is I I identified four uh, of these pillars uh, that I believe Jesus based his his hope upon. And um, four vignettes from the life of Christ drawn from the book Desire of Ages. And so what I'd like to to do is to read a, a, um, a passage from that book that illustrates that foundational pillar of hope in Christ's own experience, and then we can talk about each, okay? All right, so the first, uh, the first passage is from Desire of Ages, page 123, and it reads, The prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me. There was in him nothing that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin, 
Not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ that we may attain to perfection of character. And how this is accomplished, Christ has shown us. By what means did he overcome the conflict with Satan? By the word of God. Only by the word could he resist temptation. It is written, he said, and unto us are given exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. Every promise in God's word is ours. By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God are we to live. When assailed by temptation, look not to circumstances or to weaknesses of self, but to the power of the word. All its strength is yours. Thy word, says the psalmist, have I hid in my heart that I may, might not sin against thee. By, thy, by the word of thy lips have I kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Psalm 119, verses 11 and 17, verse 4. So again... Passage from the Desire of Ages, page 123. So that first foundational pillar in Christ's experience that established his hope was faith in his Father's promises. Yes, Brian. You know, I have to, you can't back this up by teeth, but I have the personal conviction that the whole Old Testament was first and foremost primarily for Christ to know his mission and what who God was. Yeah. I believe that as well. Yes, that's right. I, I, that's a profound thought, actually, <laughs> that the Bible, the Old Testament scriptures, were actually primarily written for Jesus. You know, Jesus did not come down to this earth uh, born as a, as a human with, you know, all of the history of uh, the pre-incarnation state there in the glories of heaven with, with his father downloaded into his brain. Uh, he did not have an, uh, the knowledge of the great controversy and Satan's rebellion in heaven and all of that just sort of implanted into his brain. He didn't come with that knowledge. He learned in the same way that you and I learned. He learned from the scriptures, guided by the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus studied the book of Job, just like you and I studied the book of Job, he began to understand the great controversy, what the issues of the great controversy were all about. Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28, all of these scriptures, Jesus began to piece these things together and understand what was going on, the big picture. Our lesson talks about that this week, the big picture. And so he began to, uh, to understand the unfolding of the plan of salvation as he studied the sanctuary. So that's a very profound thought that the scriptures actually were written primarily for Jesus to, uh, you know, for him to understand his mission, to understand the issues in the great controversy. Secondarily, they are written for us, but primarily they were written for Jesus. And it's interesting to study, especially the Old Testament scriptures, in the light that these were actually written for Jesus. So thank you for that, Brian. So the very first pillar, I believe, in the experience of Jesus that served as the foundation for his hope was trust and faith in his Father's promises by the word. Let's look at the second foundational pillar in Christ's experience of hope. And this is uh, Desire of Ages, page 687. This is the Gethsemane experience. <clears throat> how hopeless appeared the guilt. Notice that, how hopeless appeared the guilt and ingratitude of men. In its hardest feature, Satan pressed the situation upon the Redeemer. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages have rejected you. They're all seeking to destroy you. The foundation, the center, and the seal of the promises made to them as a peculiar people. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instruction and who has been among the foremost in church activities will betray you. One of your most zealous followers will deny you all will, will forsake you. I'll just pause there. What was Satan seeking to do at this juncture? He was seeking to undermine Christ's hope. 
That was the issue there. You know, shortly before this experience, in fact, we just read it, um, the prince of this world cometh, he hath nothing in me. You know, all of the powers of hell had been focused upon Jesus to try to get him to sin. If we can, if we can get him in some way or another to, to mess up, maybe it would be by anger, maybe it would be uh, in some other way. But at this point, Satan, you know, after three and a half years of trying to get Jesus to sin and, and being unsuccessful in that regard, now Satan is trying a different tactic. He is trying to get him to lose his hope. Lose his hope. Yes? Yes, um, you said part of it that I was about to say is that Satan's aim from the very inception was to frustrate Jesus to such an extent that he would not go to the cross mm -hmm. because he knew that if Jesus conquered the cross, his doom was sure. Yes. And he did not want us to be saved. Satan doesn't love us. And for those who think that Satan has an ounce of love for us, they are mm -hmm. mistaken. He just wants to see all of us lost and join him in the lake of fire. Right. So, at so every we, turn he will after Jesus to frustrate him. And to that's right. Him. And so here, in this most vulnerable state of, of Christ, it was, you know, he was taking special aim and attack at Christ's hope. So let's continue. So it goes on um, in, in this uh, chapter on Gethsemane. Turning away, Jesus sought again his retreat and fell prostrate, overcome by the horror of a great darkness. The humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He prayed not now for his disciples that their faith might not fail, but for his own tempted, agonized soul. The awful moment had come. That moment which, which was to to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. Christ might even now refuse to drink the cup apportioned to guilty man. It was not yet too late. He might wipe the bloody sweat from his brow, leave man to perish in his iniquity. He might say, let the transgressor receive the penalty of his sin and I will go back to my father. Will the son of God drink the bitter cup of humiliation and agony? Will the innocent suffer the consequences of the curse of sin to save the guilty? The words fall trembling from the pale lips of Jesus. Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Three times he has uttered that prayer. Three times has humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's Redeemer. He sees that the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds its impending fate, and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood, that through him perishing millions may gain everlasting life. He has left the courts of heaven where all is purity, happiness, and glory to save one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression, and he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of a race that has willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. The second pillar in Christ's foundation of hope is perfect surrender to the will of his Father. Any thoughts on that? And so, again, as we study this, Jesus has worked out a perfect hope that then he gives to us. And so, what was the foundational, what were the foundational pillars for Christ's hope? They are to be our foundational pillars as well. And so, perfect submission to the will of the Father is a key for our hope. Yes. That leads to obedience. That perfect That's right. submission leads to obedience. Yeah. And we see our first parents, or Adam and Eve, they fell in the Garden of Eden because of disobedience. I think we should learn to take God at, at his word. If he says, the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely mm -hmm. die. 
some of us are willing to still try now to see if it's at the very moment or if it's five years after the moment, we are willing to dare. So I would say that our first lesson that we should learn is how to submit ourselves to the will of God, not our selfish will, and be obedient. Mm -hmm. If we are obedient, we will be victorious. Okay. Any other thoughts on this second pillar, Christ's hope? All right, well, let's go. Yes, jump on. Um, I think what is interesting in that story is to see the struggle that is going on, even in Christ's heart. Mm -hmm. He was sinless, but he has that struggle. You know, to accept the, the whole mm -hmm. And, and thank you for that. And isn't it a comforting thought that Jesus actually had a will that may not have been the same as his father's will, right? Not my will be done, he said, but your will. Jesus did not want to go through this experience, but he yielded to the father. And so we have an elder brother, do we not, that understands our, our, um, our struggles with our own will that may be at odds with the Father's will. Yes, Joe. I find it fascinating that Hebrews brings this out in Hebrews 12, 2, where it says it was the joy that was set before him. Mm -hmm. If we ever wonder how much God values a sinner mm -hmm. who is repenting and coming to Christ, look at that as his hope that carried him through that great night in Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. He saw joy. He saw people coming to Christ in 2022 giving their lives to him. And that joy is what compelled him yes. to go through, yeah. along with obviously the surrender to his father's will. But yeah. I just can't get over that. It was the joy that was set before him. But you know, it's interesting uh, in listening, I was listening uh, to um, the, the chapter on Gethsemane this week. And um, you know, the, as, we, as we just noticed, or noted that Satan was attacking the hope of Jesus, saying, look, this isn't going to be worth it. Uh, nobody cares. This, you know, it, you're going to go through all of this. You're going to be separated from your father. And, you know, what's it going to amount to? But Jesus ultimately made the decision first to go through with this no matter what, at any cost to himself. And then what happened? Then Gabriel, God commissioned an angel to come down and strengthen him. So he had to make that decision first that I will go through with this. And then, it was then I think that he had that, that sense of the, the travail of his soul would be, would be worth it, right? But, uh, but it was that, that choice that he had to make to submit to his father's will that had to happen first. All right, continuing on, uh, a little bit later in this, uh, in this experience then, uh, we find in, in Desire of Ages, page 753, we'll look at the third pillar upon which Christ's hope was based. So continuing on. Upon Christ, as our substitute and surety, was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. And then it goes on to say, amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given him. He was acquainted with the character of his Father, he understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. 
By faith he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission he had committed himself to, himself to God, the sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith Christ was victor. So what do you see in this passage that uh, was a turning point? Because the passage said that hope did not present to him you know, coming forth from the grave. But then something changed. What was it? Pastor Bill. Well, what I, I read that passage, it just tells us that when we can't look forward, we can look back. Okay. And, and retrace the steps of our journey. Oh, God has always been there with us. Yeah. He's never, he's never departed. He's never failed us. And so when you can't look forward, look back. Look back. All right. Yeah, I like that. When you cannot... When you cannot look forward as Jesus, it was just darkness ahead of him. What did he do? He looked back and he remembered what? He remembered his father's character of love and mercy and justice. He remembered those tokens of, um, uh, the, you know, at the baptism and, and the transfiguration that uh, was his father's approval. And uh, so I see the third pillar then of, of Christ's Faith or, or his hope being a knowledge of and a reliance upon his father's character. And that is to be uh, our, uh, ours as well, knowing God's character. Yes, Dr. Small. You know, I, I think that an advantage that God gives us, okay, in the example of, of Thomas after Christ's resurrection, where he, he wouldn't believe until he experienced it, God, uh, Jesus said, Blessed are, you know, blessed are the people who will accept the testimony mm -hmm. of others. We are blessed with the, the, in the Old and New Testament, plus religious history, the example of what's happened to other people. Mm -hmm. And a sign of spiritual maturity is, if I can learn from exper an experience you have had, you mm -hmm. trusted God, it turned out well, if I can accept that, mm -hmm. that's what God wants us to do. That, we, we have no backup plan. We, we are putting everything on, on him, and he will, he has given us so many stories mm -hmm. of, of people who, who were in similar circumstances to what we may face, yeah. and how it turned out, and that's, that's something to be very grateful for. Okay. So we, talk, we said earlier that the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, were primarily written for Jesus. I would suggest that the the Bible in its entirety was secondarily written for the 144,000. <laughs> and then, you know, as a, as a uh, perhaps a, a tertiary would be, you know, maybe that's uh, simplifying things too much. But, uh, but thank you for that comment. Yes, Scott. And you know, as, as we go through this, we've, we've, we've noticed that Jesus did not rely at any point on his feelings. Yes. No. Amen. That it was always something uh, much greater and deeper than, and stronger than that. And sometimes we, have, I think, are tempted to be uh, motivated by our, our feelings. But it is uh, something much deeper than that that we must base our, our, our hope upon. Well, let's, let's look at the last um, pillar the last pillar, uh, and this is from Desire of Ages, page 799. Reasoning from prophecy, Christ gave his disciples a correct idea of what he was to be in humanity. This is the, road, uh, the conversation that he was having uh, on the road to Emmaus with his disciples. <clears throat> their, their expectation of a Messiah who was to take his throne in, uh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. Their expectation of a Messiah 
who was to take his throne in kingly power in accordance with the desires of men, had been misleading. It would interfere with the correct apprehension of his descent from the highest to the lowest position that could be occupied. Christ desired that the ideas of his disciples might be pure and true in every specification. They must understand as far as possible in regard to the cup of suffering that had been apportioned to him. He showed them that the awful conflict which they could not yet comprehend was the fulfillment of the covenant made before the foundation of the world was laid. Christ must die, as every transgressor of the law must die if he continues in sin. All this was to be, but it was not to end in defeat, but in glorious eternal victory. Jesus told them that every effort must be made to save the world from sin. His followers must live as he lived and work as he worked with intense persevering effort. So this passage began with this. Reasoning from what? Prophecy. And so that is the fourth pillar, I believe, that Jesus' hope was based upon, the sure word of prophecy. And so I see in these four pillars of Christ's own experience, trust in his Father's faith in his Father's word and his Father's promises, the second one was uh, uh, submission, perfect submission to his father's will. Uh, thirdly was the, um, what was the third one? A knowledge and reliance upon his father's character. And then finally, uh, the sure word, trust in the sure word of prophecy. As those as being the, the foundational pillars of, of Christ's hope. And those are also the foundational pillars of our hope. And I believe that that is really what will result in a people who are, can be sealed. And that will, um, you know, answer the question um, as to, uh, or, or that will enable uh, Christ to be able to, uh, to cut short that delay. And so uh, may our, our hope uh, not be based upon our feelings or misplaced. Uh, one thing I was going to look at, we don't have time to, to go into this in great detail, but I just want to say that there is such a thing as a misplaced or a vain hope. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Paul said, um, if it's in this life only that we have hope, we are what? Men most miserable. And is there a group of people that is described as being miserable in the Bible? Laodicea is described as being miserable. Their hope is in this life only. So there is a type of hope that is misplaced. That, um, that is not a true biblical hope. And uh, so that's a, that's a topic for another time. But um, let's go ahead and uh, bow our heads for prayer. Lord, thank you so much for these foundational pillars of hope that we have, that Jesus has worked out perfectly for us. He gives us uh, this as a gift. We thank you so much for his experience, what he went through. We just read a little bit about his experience and how he developed uh, this hope for us. Uh, your people in the end time need to have an an end-time faith and an end-time hope that is uh, unshakable, that is indestructible. Uh, that's not something that we can develop on our own, but it is something that you have developed and you have promised to give us that, uh, that hope. And so, Lord, may, it, may these blessings continue on with us, and I pray that you will do that work in each of our hearts. I pray.